difficult to compare uh, junior results and senior results. So you are such a star that I have a photo with you. There you go. So that's me on the left here. Uh, experience and the more training years uh, you get, of course, you can get a lot better. Like yeah. as a kid or junior, it's a bit more about talent, I would say. Welcome, everybody. Today, I'm meeting with Oli Ayanaho, uh, the famous Finnish runner. And we'll be talking about many interesting things regarding his career, his junior years, his senior years, his goals, his approach to uh, orienteering, man managing his stress, and lots of other things. So I think that's going to be a lot of interesting stuff. If this is your first time to the channel, this is Into the Forest I Go, when we are talking about orienteering, a sport where you run with the map and compass. And already on the channel, you can find lots of interesting videos. There's also a podcast that you can go to. And if you want to support the effort, then you can also use the link below to access the Patronite and become the patron. And with that, I'm coming back to Oli. Welcome, Oli, to the channel. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. So we already had some uh, interesting chat um, before 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 this main part that will go to the Patreonite, uh, where we were talking about uh, the training camps during summer and your connection to cross country skiing, uh, your experience with different terrains for training not only with the map also without the map for uh, orient for for winter period when it comes to orienteering, uh, your connection to. Uh, France and and speaking French and and many other interesting things, uh, but in this one I want to focus more on um, the professional part of your past career and uh, let's see what we can learn from you. What the people listening to the channel can learn from you in regards to um, the most crucial elements of every orienteer's life. So I feel like I've. Uh, been part of your journey, not, not of course from your perspective, but from my perspective, because those jaywalks that you were so successful on, uh, I've been there and I saw it firsthand how you've been grabbing those medals and it has been amazing. So as far as I remember, you have from, from jaywalks, you have six golds, one silver and two bronze. Is that correct? Or was it two silvers? Well, you don't I remember, can't remember my Yeah. Okay, that's Something not very like important. That, anyway, that's not very important. But uh, from what I saw, I think you're the most decorated uh, junior male athlete in history. So that says something. And uh, and you know, I, I, I I'm, I'm not getting impressed easily, but that definitely was impressive, and your performance definitely uh, was impressive. And you were a star during those jaywalks. You you were a star. I'll actually show you something because I came prepared. So you are such a star that I have a photo with you. There you go. So that's me on the left here. Yeah. Right? And then I that's another it's... coach of the Polish team. So Is it from Romania? From no, the... it's, uh, as far as I remember, it's from Norway. Okay. I think it's, it's, it's from Bergen, Norway, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. I checked yeah, the maybe. dates. I think it was 2015. Yeah, but yeah, it could have been also from uh, Romania, from the... From European Europe. Youth Orienteering Champs. Yeah, actually, maybe, maybe. Because anyway, I, it's definitely yeah, from 2015. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, looking at the building, it might have been from Romania. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, and the, the your performances during these years, uh, you were like uh, on top of everyone else. And uh, I, what I wanted to ask is uh, how much you know, work and effort did it cost you to get to the very top in terms of junior orienteering at that time? Mm, well, I would say that it came more or less like naturally. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was, I was still doing many sports, uh, especially until I was 16 or I was doing also, besides orienteering, I was doing football until, until I was 14, ice hockey until I was 15, then cross-country skiing and ski orienteering uh, until I was 16, and some a few races after that as well. Yeah. So I, I don't think I was like training more orienteering than the others. 
but somehow I I think I had some talent for uh, for understanding the map uh, and also for performing under pressure I would say uh, because I I don't think I think the marching down the the next guys wasn't always that big but some somehow I was maybe able to keep my head cool a bit better uh, as a junior could be one reason as well so uh, i think we will come back to this part because i have it later uh, towards towards the end of the questions but i also get an impression i had it before and today when i'm when i'm talking to you i kind of get the same vibe you're a very calm person aren't you yeah i would say so <laughs> <laughs> You don't get rattled very easily. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, I think I think that helps. I think that helps because if you're like very hectic, it, it, sometimes it becomes difficult to calm yourself, especially during those periods where you get to experience this additional amount of stress yeah. that maybe you're not really acquainted with. Yeah, and I think it's an advantage uh, when you're uh, a junior, and then when getting into the senior class like uh, all those people that are maybe not naturally as good uh, uh, at this part they can get a lot better so i don't think it's uh, it's uh, as big of an advantage anymore because yeah the more uh, experience and the more training years uh, you get of course you can get a lot better like yeah. As a kid or junior, it's a bit more about talent, I would say. I think it's also connected with really growing up. You know, you, you, you grow up and you become more mature and it's easier to process your emotions and handle them. So uh, I, I definitely agree that when, when you're at, at the junior level and you're already able to um, handle your emotions a, a lot better than your competition, it's a big advantage, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, when you when you jumped from your junior career to the senior career, um, uh, you you did manage to get to the top immediately, and I think you still don't have the podium position from the world orienting champs. But I think you've been fourth, two thousand twenty one Czech Republic, right? Uh, yeah, in the relay. In the relay, yeah, yeah. So, so um, how how far do you think you're away from the medal positions, and do you think that? This year, maybe is the year that you will be able to hop on the podium at the ceremony. Yeah, I think maybe for uh, I think for the very very best guys like Kasper and Matthias and uh, all the biggest favorites, the gap is still quite big, or it, it's hard to catch that kind of gap. But for like for the bronze medal, I think. Uh, there are quite many guys that are uh, pretty even and that I think it's more would be more reachable. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, last season I was fourth in the European Champs middle and then fourth in the World Cup in Davos in both middle and long distance. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. So that, it's of, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, there were some like runners missing like Matthias wasn't running the World Cup in Davos and, and some people are always having some problems or injured or anything. So it's not a, any type of guarantee that even if I'm in as good uh, uh, shape as I was last year, that I would be fourth, I can be seventh or eighth, even if I'm running as well technically and even if the shape is as good. But still, I, I, I think... Uh, when it comes to the medal possibility, I think it's about very small things like just to get uh, a bit faster and stronger physically and also a bit more effective technically. Yeah, I would say because I'm 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 not making so many mistakes. Like if you take my GPS line, it usually looks pretty good. Of course, not always, but usually. But I I think I'm not as effective as as the very best guys i'm i'm getting 
uh, a bit answer a bit too often and then I'm quite slow uh, when I get answer answer um, so uh, that's one like a bit more concrete thing that I should improve to be able to get a medal at VOC I think yeah awesome that's good so working on your un uncertainty and you know maybe having more um, technique together with belief uh, that, that yeah. definitely help yeah like to more to get and uh, to prevent getting answer yeah answer yeah uh, guess I think Ulav Lundanes put it very well once in some uh, he was having some presentation or something in Finland mm -hmm. when he was living here and he said that that it's underestimated how much you lose when you're not 100 percent sure and I think it's very true especially totally for agree. me because I'm I'm when I'm answer I get yeah of course everyone loses time but me I get I'm, I'm so calm that I I stop very easily I'm I'm not as quick at, uh, at fixing these problems as some other runners like for example in Euro meeting 2019 in Estonia um, there was a middle distance in the same terrain where the walk middle 2017 was held and I was doing a very good race um, and then I, I I had to I remember I I was not so much behind Timo Sild who won the race mm -hmm. um, and I was very confused because when I checked the uh, the split times I was leading uh, like by 15, 20 seconds, maybe uh, like three controls before the finish. And I remember I was running like super fast to the second last control. I felt very strong. And I remember that I only had to stop once uh, during that leg. Uh, but I was so uh, so calm somehow that I didn't realize how much it cost me when I got answer there. And then when I took a look at the GPS tracking, I noticed that I I, I was it, this 15, 20 seconds before, and then I was running actually a bit, f maybe slightly faster than sealed uh, on this lake. But then when I got answer, I had to stop. And I was actually almost standing still for 30 seconds. So it's a, uh, it's, uh, big uh, thing to improve for me <laughs> okay yeah that's 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 a very interesting insight I, I want to stop here actually and dig a little bit deeper into this because um it's it's very interesting from the perspective that um whenever you feel that something is wrong right how do you re you, re you how do you react to it you can you can keep pushing and hope that you will be able to fix it while running or uh, as you did, you can stop and try to fix it calmly. Um, w which approach do you think is better? Like if you if you go back to that one leg, do you think it was a right decision to stop over there and spend this time trying to figure out, or do you think that you maybe should have kept pushing and um, the the time loss would have been avoided, or? Is it the other end of the spectrum? If you kept pushing, you would probably be risking a lot more and making a bigger mistake. Yeah, well, I, I think it was the right decision for me, mm -hmm. at least that time, uh, to stop there uh, and not continue. Uh, but I think, or like what I'm trying to, what I've been trying to improve the, in the past couple of years. Uh, it is how to like not to not to base my orienteering on just uh, one d detail and mm -hmm. that when it doesn't match uh, into my thoughts that I had um, that I don't need to trust only that one detail because then I need to if it doesn't match I need to slow down and, and stop and I will lose time. Um, so I think what could have helped me um, would have been to be able to trust my direction, for example, mm -hmm. that I know, and I know that I'm running in the right direction and I was here 
just uh, 15 seconds ago and there's still like 200 meters um before the control so if i if i continue in the same direction i i should be able to uh, relocate and also to be kind of more more uh, a bit more ahead uh, in my planning when i'm like planning the leg to like have to already have uh, some bigger features uh, just before the control or behind the control uh, to be able to trust that I will see them. Beautiful. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, exactly what I would say as a coach. <laughs> so yeah. all the conclusions, they sound very good. And this is exactly what I'm teaching people uh, when we're working at uh, together at the Orienteering Academy. So don't trust just, just one thing, right? Have at least two, if possible, three things that you are looking at during the lag, right? And if if one of them starts to get a little bit alarmish, then, you know, check the others. And if the others are good, then it's probably sensible to make a decision to keep going until another um, red flag is raised, right? But most of the time you will be you will be fine because sometimes we misinterpret the, the terrain features slightly, right? It, it, it can happen even to the best. All right, yeah. um, so very interesting discussion, but let's go back um, to uh, to what we are talking about. So we were talking about um, your walk goals, your races. Um, you, you compared yourself also a little bit to one of the best runners like, like Matthias and Kasper. Uh, what do, so two questions in this area. How do you feel your current physical form is compared to last year? Do you feel that there is this small progress, small step forward? Is it better? And when you were talking about um, these two guys, that they are a little bit out of reach maybe, uh, except maybe for, for some lucky races, is it like a physical gap? Or is it more like an orienteering gap or, or, or both, for, uh, in your case, of course? Uh, yeah, I think uh, for the first question, I think um i i have had some quite promising trainings this winter uh, where i have felt that i might be in a bit better shape than last year uh, but then i got ill in uh, in mid march and after that i haven't really uh got back the the same good feeling so at the moment it, uh, the shape feels approximately the same um, and then I, when comparing with Casper uh, and Matthias, I think it's it's at, there's at least a, a physical gap, but I think also also technical, like uh, and it's more about this uh, thing we just uh, were talking about. Mm -hmm. It's not like that. I miss. I make more uh, like control mistakes that my. You can see from my that you could see uh, see from my GPS line that I'm running worse. It's more it's more about the things um, that you can spot when just looking at the GPS tracking. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, what are the most important races for you during the season? Is it like world champs, or are there any any other important races that you? definitely put a lot of emphasis on. Yeah, of course, the walk is the number one uh, most important uh, week of the year. Uh, I've been preparing for that quite a lot in the past two years, actually, because uh, doing my exchange studies uh, in France, one of the main reasons was to be able to do some more orienteering in continental terrains uh, ahead of this uh, walk this year okay and then like this winter i've spent the whole winter trying to collect some uh, more climbing and train uh, my downhill running and and run more uh, orienteering in relevant terrains so of course walk is the number one um, but then also i'd like to run well in the world cup in norway uh, and then in tu milan yukola they are very important for me and my club uh, okay so okay at least those so th th that's what i thought that Tiomira and yukola will come up and i think it's like a 
very common theme for many top athletes in Scandinavia. These two competitions are very big for you, right? For, for, for some reason. What, what is the reason? I always wonder, what, why, why are these two competitions so important? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. I think it's uh, somehow about uh, just the orienteering culture here, here in Scandinavia. Uh -huh. uh, so if you're born here, you you just... Yeah, you just can't can't help uh, seeing Team Milan Yukola as a very big thing and as uh, one of the highlights of the season. And then, of course, when we have like the best clubs, are I think they are mostly Scandinavian. Uh, so all the best clubs are here, and so the everyone is like talking about those relays during the winter training uh, and e uh, every club is aiming for those so it's uh, something that uh, something common for I think every club in Norway Sweden and Finland it's, it's, it's probably like historically right these these two competitions yeah. are so old that you know everybody has been doing them and now especially now when the new generation is growing they are just probably grabbing this kind of energy from their parents and their yeah. older colleagues in the sports club um yeah it's really it, it, it amazes me because these are night running competitions right i, I mean the, the women are running during the day although I, I heard that there are going to be some changes do you know something about it yeah yeah next year i think uh, there will be night legs uh, in Team Mila for uh, yeah, women. Yeah. But, but in general, like the main part is run at night. So that's already amazing in itself that you're making, you know, a relay that lasts the whole night. I mean, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> so yeah. when I've been there, we, we didn't, for example, have the first time I've been to Team Mila, uh, we didn't have the, the heated tent. So it was freaking cold at night. <laughs> and I remember I had troubles sleeping and uh I, I also remember that the when we came back from from sweden to poland we immediately we immediately bought sleeping bags uh that are a lot warmer than than the ones we've had uh but also you know even for for, for the uh spectator from the spectator's perspective if you want to follow such a competition you, you need to spend the whole night <laughs> sitting in front of the uh screen or if you're at the arena, you know, freezing somewhere over there, sitting at the chair, that's not really awesome and comfortable. So that, that's what amazes me, that that it's like harsh conditions, night racing, which is uh, a lot more challenging than, than, than day racing. And still, for so many people, it's like the most important start of the year, almost. Almost, maybe not the most important, but one of the most important starts of the year. It's awesome. I really like it. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, uh, it's not that comfortable uh, all the time, but I think that's the charm in it. Exactly, exactly. So it, it has its charm because of it. Exactly. Um, what is the most cherished result of your career so far? Hmm. I think um, yeah. Of course, it's a. Uh, it's a bit difficult to compare uh, junior results and senior results. Like, I think it felt much better to win JVOC than to become fourth in the European Champs or World mm -hmm. Cup. Although I think uh, the fourth place in the senior class is like a better achievement still. So you, you think this one is the best one so far? The, the yeah, one you're most yeah, happy about. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. But I, I think uh, when I won, uh, won Chevok, I think I, it was more uh, emotional, fulfilling. Yeah, I, I, that, that that was my guess. I was wondering what you will pick. But uh, yeah, I think that you know, if, if you would be um, getting one or two wins at the Chevok, uh, then I, I think that you wouldn't have a problem of picking the fourth place. But because you had an amazing streak and you were dominating um, for you know so many races, I think it is a huge achievement. So yeah, good good, good job going with it. 
And another one, a little bit connected with it, but really different is, um, do you remember any particular race where uh, you like won by a hair, you know, just slightly by a second or a few seconds. And that was also like a wonderful feeling to be able to do that. Has it happened to you? Mm. Yeah, I think maybe, maybe the Jaybox sprint in Finland, 2017. Mm -hmm. It was a very tight race, and I, of course, I was, I was training a bit more sprint than before because I knew that uh, I'm not as good uh, in sprint as I'm in forest, and it was my last uh, year uh, at Jaybox, so I knew that could be my last uh, shot in uh, in the sprint yeah. to be to get a, a really good result like before moving to senior class um but still it was uh, maybe a small surprise that i won and it wasn't by many seconds i think i was still a bit a couple of seconds behind at the second last control or something mm -hmm. but then i was pretty fast from there to finish and managed to take home that one. Good. I asked this because I personally feel like these are the races I remember the most very often. Uh, so, so the ones that, you know, it, it took just yeah, a tiny mistake to actually lose uh, and or the ones where like uh, on the relay, on the last leg, you're racing to the finish with someone uh, for for the place, so these are also the ones that I usually remember very very well. Yeah, yeah, I think it's the same for me uh, as well. All right, uh, let's let's move on. Um, I'm looking at the next one, but I think we mostly talked about this. Uh, I'm gonna I'm going to read it, but I. Don't think we, we want to dig into this again. So I, I, I had a question like, if you race Casper Fosser in a one-man relay, one-man relay, so you're starting together, um, yeah. how many times out of 10 would you win? And, and I'm guessing it's going to be below five because you already said that uh, Casper Fosser is yeah, probably yeah, yeah. better. And of course, then the follow-up question was like, what are you missing to win uh, most of them or all of them? But I think we talked about it. But if you want to add something to it, you can. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, of course. It, yeah, if we are. If we assume that I'm racing again against the uh, Casper, who is uh, in his top shape, I think I would only manage to win maybe twice or something, once or twice. Mm -hmm. Um. And I think it's, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, it's both, uh, there's a, a physical gap, but also I think he's, he's not only very fast, he's also super good at the technical part, and especially when it counts. Uh, so he's always, or yeah, I would say always at his best uh, at, at the walk and do you, do you think uh, it's in the, in the main races. Yeah, I think... Yeah, maybe for sure some part of it yeah, could be I, talent. I often but... wonder uh, about this. Like, how much talent do you need to be good at orienteering? And, you know, I've been doing orienteering for more than, uh, maybe not more. Yeah, more, more than 30, not, not, not more than 30, but almost 30 years. And, uh, you know, a good, a good part of that, I've been involved in coaching so i have been observing people and watching people grow and watching many people come into orienteering and struggle to get good at it and i feel like there there is a talent at play here so there are some people that come they've never done any sort of orienteering before even in boy scouts or whatever you know and they get the map they go into the forest and they understand they understand how to use the map. Of course, they need to learn the symbols. They need to learn uh, the control descriptions, stuff like that. And of course, they lack the speed of you know reading and connecting the dots. But if they go slowly, they are more or less able to do that, right? And, and for other people, I can see that they come, 
they participate in training sessions, they make progress, but the progress is a lot slower than, than for others. So I, I think there is talent in play here. And I also think that when, when I had a conversation with Kasper, I got the feeling that he has the talent thing. Yeah, but I, I think uh, maybe even more important is um, is how how like kind of motivated you are to put a lot of time and energy into your training and preparations uh, over a long term over a long period of time uh, because we are uh, I'm 26 Casper is 24 so we've been doing our engineering like 15 years yeah I've been doing it 20 years so it's a lot of it's like I don't think it's it's that important like where you start like what's the what's your talent when you're running the your first uh, season or your second season or third it's more about how much better you can get when you are training more uh, and I think that's maybe you could call it like uh, a talent as well like a mental talent to to have like the motivation and uh, and to be, yeah to be able to prioritize your your training uh, uh, and focus on the most important things that will make you better at orienteering and I, I think that's uh, for sure one thing Casper has been really good at. I like what you said very much. I'm not even going to comment on it. I'm just going to say for everyone watching that, that if you're struggling. Uh, with getting better at orienteering, just go back 30 seconds and listen to all you get. This is, this is really important. So I, I think that, you know, that doesn't matter how much talent you have. Um, you still can get to the very top uh, in terms of orienteering skills with very focused practice. That's what you said. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. I think one, one very good example is, uh, is my teammate Elias Kuka. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he he has never been a talent by any any means. If you if you are defining talent as uh, as the like the level of which you are at when you when you start doing orienteering, uh, he wasn't that good when he was a junior, but uh, he's been very uh, consistent and serious. Uh, in, in, during many years um, and now finally uh, last season he was uh, he got the bronze medal at the uh, long distance at the European champs yeah and if like I've been training with him a lot and I can really see that uh, at least for him it's zero percent about uh, like talent uh, and hundred percent of just the uh, hard work and awesome. And I'm, super, I'm super happy yeah. to hear it. I, th I think there are lots of people that need to hear it as well. You know, so hopefully some of them are, will be watching this. <laughs> um, let's let's switch gears a little bit. So uh, we, we talked about your um, winter training camps. Two of them were with the national team. The national team of Finland is currently being trained by Thierry Jojo. How is it working uh, with Thierry? How much uh, how, how much is he able to bring into the national team? And uh, what did you learn from him? Yeah, I think um, um, as, as our head coach, he has uh, a lot of other stuff to do uh, as well than just the training part. Like he's making the budgets and and making all the reservations for the training camp, like the flight, booking the flight tickets yeah. and accommodations and and all that. So of course he has uh, a lot of job to do, and he's he's not able to focus uh, all his hours on on just uh, training and discussing with us. Uh, so it's uh, but that's not something he can affect. Uh, because it's more about the budget of our national team. Um, but I think uh, uh, at least he's working super, super much. 
and I, I think the best thing about him has been that you can really kind of feel that everything that he does um, is meant for you and that you would get better, better as an orienteer um, because I think it's that's quite tricky as a coach to really uh, get the athletes feel that way because um, quite often you when the athletes are skipping some of your trainings or they disagree with you I think it's very easy to get some like negative emotions uh, as a coach when you are like putting a lot of energy in the organizing some trainings and then some at- athletes I don't think it's the it's part of their <laughs> training plan um, but for theory I, I think it's the good thing on our training camp is that we we are allowed to skip trainings if they are not fitting in into our personal training plan. Mm-hmm. Um, so so you really, as an athlete, you really get, uh, or at least I have got the feeling that he's doing every like he's just thinking about uh, what is best for me and not um, and not like trying to to like be a good coach like in the in the first place uh, i think he really understands that if he, if he does everything he can for the athletes then he will be uh, the best possible version of himself as a coach as well yeah i, I i'm guessing that he's pretty passionate about it he, he was a very passionate runner so I'm, I'm pretty sure that he carries that passion as a coach now as well. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And um, of course, it's uh, it, even if you're, uh, I think he's a 14-time world champion or something like that. Yeah. But anyway, it, it it doesn't. It's no guarantee that you can you can just transform that into being a great coach. Because it's a lot of a lot about uh, communication with your athletes, and it, it's not enough to have the knowledge you need to be able to communicate that as well. But I think uh, that's something Thierry has been very good at, and I I, I think I've been a bit surprised actually how good he is. Like I, I more often than not when I'm leaving a meeting uh, before the uh, before a the evening before a World Cup race or walk race or European champs, um, I can really like feel the enthusiasm in my body. And that's, it's a sign that he has been able to communicate his message very well because it's, uh, I think it's super hard to, um, to be able to present your ideas and thoughts that well that that uh, those who are in the audience can really feel feel it in their body <laughs> yeah that's again very well said uh, I have to say from the coach's perspective that it's always a challenge for me you know I mean I realize that uh, those kind of chats before those big competitions they are very important so and I, and I cannot go to those meetings unprepared so I always spend at, at least a couple of hours just thinking about, okay, what do I need to say? I'm making some notes. I'm, I'm trying to think how I want to say things so that the, the athletes will get this, this kind of feeling, this kind of energy from the meeting. And, you know, instead of rattling them, I, I definitely want to calm them down and boost their uh, belief in themselves, really. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, another thing that, that I want to comment on, which is, which is, I think, very sensible. So let me ask you this. You, you have your, like, club coach. Thierry is not your full-time coach, but you have your no. club coach, you're working with someone else, and Thierry is just a national team coach. Yeah. Right. So it's, of course, the same uh, for me as a national coach for, for the junior team, and it has been for all the all of the years. So I think it's normal, and that's how it works everywhere. And in this regard, I, I think that it's not fair 
from uh, the national team coach to expect that you're organizing the training camp, you're organizing training sessions during the training camp, and now everybody has to run each, each and one of these sessions because different people might be in different parts of their training regime, right? Some people might need a little bit of a break because they came from another training camp. Some people might be rested, right? So uh, for me, it was always absolutely understandable that if someone before the training camp comes to me and says, look, uh, there are 12 sessions planned, but I'm actually going to skip three of them because I need some rest or it doesn't fit into my schedule. You know, I was always totally okay with that. And I can't imagine it working any other way, really. Yeah, yeah, uh, I think so too. But it might not always be that easy because, of course, uh, sometimes you can get a bit emotional when, uh, yeah, like it's not maybe for you, but for some people it can be a thing if you, if you, like, if you're not able to not take it personally, like, I don't think, uh, I think many coaches uh, are taking those kind of things a bit personally. Hmm. Interesting. Some, sometimes, so I, I, I think uh, there are some differences between different coaches. Interesting to hear. I never ima imagined it. Uh, but okay, let's move on. How did your orienteering philosophy change between your junior years and now? So, I mean, like, uh, did, what is the biggest difference you see between yourself when you were 19, 20 years old and, you know, now fast forward six years later? Uh, do you mean like the like, uh, orienteering technique or? Um, I, I, I specifically didn't uh, go into the details because I was wondering which topic you will touch. But yes, it can be an orienteering technique. I think it can be also in terms of the mental approach, mental preparation. Yeah, I think when it comes to orienteering technique, I I have tried to to um, to not not uh, stick to those small details as we talked about earlier, and uh, to have to always have a better and more comprehensive plan for uh, each leg. Um, and also, as a junior, I I always wanted to train on the good maps to get uh, more quality for the trainings. But when we, as we talked about um, this, my challenge of of getting answer and that I'm very re very slow uh, when I need to react, I have realized that I actually need to train on maps where I get this feeling of being answer uh, and to really train uh, how to prevent it from happening and if it happens how to react so I'm the past few years I've been trying to also train on on maps that can be a bit old that I will get a bit confused sometimes or that are not said to be that good in some other way uh -huh. So that's been a, a change, and I I think uh, uh, I'm now a bit better at that, but I still have a long way to go. Or a lot of uh, can be a lot better as well. That, that, that is very interesting, and I don't hear it very often, really. So most of the time, even even for myself, right, when I'm organizing the training camp and I'm looking for maps, <clears throat> I'm thinking, okay, one year old two-year-old maps, okay, these are kind of acceptable. But if we go further back in time, that's not really good because if you run into uh, a new cut down of the cut down piece of the forest or some undergrowth that doesn't look like it's marked on the map anymore, it's confusing for runners. And it also creates really bad habits because if uh, after the training camp, you kind of realize that, okay, if something is wrong, it's probably not me, it's the map, then it's a very bad habit because then during the yeah. competition, you kind of uh, can get the same feeling. And instead of correcting your mistake, you're just going into it. But what you said is that you're actually trying to run on those older maps, but with the mindset that, okay, I know this map can 
not be perfectly accurate in some places. And my job is to work around that and uh, still be able to navigate using other features uh, that I am able to use around me. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And I, I think I meant more like not the vegetation, but more like that the contours might be a bit old. Mm -hmm. So they are not from uh, maybe not always as accurate. Yeah. Um, and because I think uh, in Finland, we, we probably have the best, like the average map quality is probably the best in the world because we have so many professional map makers. Mm -hmm. And already when I go to, to Sweden, of course, it's not, or it's, I, I would also put it this way that it's not, it's, it doesn't have to be an old map just, or not a, a bad map, but it's like a different mapping style. Yes, exactly. Um, because already when I go to Sweden, I, I can really feel that the contours, for example, are drawn a bit differently than in Finland. Um, and I get these feelings of unsureness uh, much more often than I, mm -hmm. than I get yeah, in Finland. Um, so I, I think it's the important thing for me has been to, to run more orienteering uh, abroad and try to yeah have a lot of different maps they can be old but also uh, just uh, different mappers uh, map makers sure yeah and then then you get like the varied experience of different mapping styles and yeah. maybe then it's easier to adjust to it when you encounter it again sure by the by the way i remember uh, one time when we were in sweden we were we went for, for just a, a training run somewhere very close to our accommodation. And the map had like 15 years and it was almost perfect well. So the, the forest was completely wide. So that obviously helped. So we were navigating mostly on contours and rocks and that, that doesn't change really. <laughs> so even, yeah. even though the map was super old, we were able to do very good quality, quality training. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, the next one, we're getting close to the end. Not, not much left, I have three more. So, uh, but the next one, uh, wait, wait, actually, maybe you want to add something more regarding the last question in terms of the mental change? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I think I don't have anything specific when it comes to like mental. Okay preparation before the that's main fine. championships if, yeah like if, if you don't have anything we, we don't have to force this so yeah. let's go to the next one so i want to talk about stress uh so we already touched this topic a little bit and uh, i already know that you're naturally a very calm person uh you also have a um, analytical mind so that definitely helps but um and, and you've also mentioned that because of this it was easier for you to handle the pressure, uh, for example, during those jaywalk starts and probably now also during the walk starts. Although I kind of suspect that the pressure is not on you now. Uh, it's like um, more on, on, the, on the runners that are defending the medal positions. That's usually where the pressure is. But you were in this situation many, many times during your junior career. Do you remember how uh, it affected you? And is there anything uh, in, in particular that you did to help yourself be calm or was it just a natural thing of, of your character? I think it was partly natural, but also I think I was able to see it somehow uh, in a positive way uh, that when I'm the, I, I quite often I was maybe the main favorite at least one of the main favorites yeah um, and I, I i just thought that as the main and i still think that as the main favorite i don't think casper has any pressure at walk because he knows that if he just does his thing it'll be enough for a gold medal fight uh, and that's how i thought when i was junior that i don't 
I don't actually have any pressure because I know that I'm in a good shape and no one is running faster than me and I can handle this task. I've been doing this uh, thing before. Uh, I know the type of terrain and how to how to orient here there. Uh, so I was somehow able to see it in a positive way and kind of enjoy it. Uh, and actually nowadays I it's a bit maybe the other way around that I, I miss that feeling and and some yeah, somehow like when I'm not the main favorite anymore, it, it's been a bit more difficult for me to to run well because it's so hard to it's it's just so different compared to my junior years and it's been hard to accept that even if I do my best it won't be I, I, I still can't win somehow okay so I think it was easier as a junior like maybe it was a bit natural as well but I, I think it was fantastic to warm up for the race and uh, stand in the starting line knowing that you are well prepared and no one is running faster than you and that if you just do your basic thing you are fighting for a win you have a chance to win so it was i really missed uh, that feeling <laughs> i can see it on your face uh very nice very nice um were you afraid to fail mm -hmm. no i wouldn't say so i think um that's always been one of my strengths that i'm not i'm I'm usually seeing all the things in a positive way, so I'm not. I haven't been afraid of failure, because I know that it's still just orienteering. Of course, it's it's uh, super important, and I think it's um, it is that it is, and, and and you really you are allowed to take uh, the sport quite seriously and become. Um, if 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 you do a really bad race, you're allowed to be disappointed, but it's still not uh, the end of the world. And I have many other like uh, things and interests, so I, I'm not defining myself as a person uh, based on my on my results as an orienteer. And also as an orienteer, I'm not defining uh, my level based on just one race. Yes, I think it's uh, you're never as good nor you're as bad as one race shows. It's more like uh, the average of maybe 10 races or something. So I think these kind of thoughts has, have helped me to to focus on the more of the positive things and not be not be fearing the failure. Nice. Uh, that's if you were thinking like this as a junior, that that's really mature for a junior. Yeah, yeah, I think, but I I think I also got a uh, lot of help, at least indirectly, from my dad. I think uh, he's played an important role uh, when it comes to the development of my of my thinking as a child and junior. Uh, I think he he's uh, he's a physical education teacher at the university uh, University of Lapland, and he's been interested of yeah just uh, he, he wasn't any elite athlete or he wasn't actually doing orienteering before he met my mom, but he's like interested in in sports in general, and I think especially like the mental part i think he's he has played an important role in my um, in my go future. dad yeah go dad shout out uh so uh, we've talked a little bit about talent and a little bit about, about hard, hard work what what do you think makes you a successful runner 
one or the other or both? Mm, I think both, but I would say more the hard work. It's maybe, yeah, not uh, zero and 100% as for Elias, as I mentioned, but it's definitely more for the hard work than talent. Cool. Congratulations then. I mean, this this takes a lot of dedication, time, effort, tears, sweat. <laughs> Good job. Uh, last one. What's the most important skill of an orienteer? What do you think? Mm. Do you mean like in when you're uh, in the race or like just overall in the preparation? Or I don't really want to define it. You pick you yeah. pick whatever you want to. Yeah, I, I I would say maybe it's yeah just um, how how good you are um, at learning from your mistakes, and it's easier. It's a lot easier said than done. Like so easy to sit here and say it but in fact it's I think it really defines uh, or it's the one of the most important factors of your success and progress uh, over the long term good thank you all right I'm going to leave you with a thought that came to my mind when you were talking about how you felt during your um warm up your pre-start preparations uh, at the jaywalk so i i have this picture in my mind and i think it will stay with me uh for, forever so it's it's very vivid i'm pretty sure it was from jaywalk in finland so your last one and i'm pretty sure it's from the long distance uh, i i have been um following the runners coming to the spectator control before the last loop and run to the finish and you probably remember that there was like uh, you were you were approaching the spectator control i think mostly along the road for most of the runners and then there was a, there was a steep climb uh, up through through some open area and then into the forest and then more up so i remember people coming to this spectator control uh, and of course long distance so they already had most of the race behind them quite tired and many of them were running up the hill very slowly many of them were walking because they were so tired and it, it, it wasn't really it, it was quite steep and i remember when you came to the control of course there was a huge crowd shouting cheering on you and you just punched the spectator control and then you didn't seem to slow down you were pushing so hard up there into the the, the next control <laughs> at least as far as we could see you and i i suspect that it was quite taxing somewhere somewhere out there in the forest when you got out of this out of sight uh but it 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 was a it, it left a huge impression on me how strong you were back then compared to the other runners and you know of course i didn't see you during the whole race so it's not a comparison that is like a scientific one but at that particular place in the race it looked amazing and i love this this, this I, I love to watch yeah, I, I I think it was a bit over speed. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think but, you said it in one of the interviews that you went a little bit too fast for the for the spectator running, but still it was amazing. So yeah. um, I wanted to leave you with that because I feel that runners like you they bring a lot of joy to all the other people that you know are are running together with you or maybe are just spectating and watching those races. Uh, for all for all of us that just love orienteering, you know, we we like the emotions, and you definitely were one of the people that brought, at least for me, lots of positive emotions. So I thank you for that. I think you're yeah. you're an amazing person, and it's been wonderful to talk with you. Some some beautiful words uh, that came from you today, and I think it's definitely uh, worth watching it. So I hope lots of people will. Uh, um, and again, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a huge pleasure. Yeah, thank you.